the contested concept of Christian identity. It has fallen to me um, to introduce my friends and colleagues um, who are going to uh, debate and discuss this concept of Christian identity, uh, Brian Birch and Michael Minch. I'll just introduce them briefly and then um, uh, I believe that they're going to be speaking subsequently and then we'll have time for questions near the end. Um, so first, uh, Dr. Brian Birch um, is uh, a, an associate professor of philosophy in the philosophy and humanities department here at Utah Valley University. Received his uh, uh, bachelor's degree in philosophy um, at, no, and master's degree from the University of Utah and a, a PhD in the philosophy of religion from Claremont Graduate School. Is the director of religious studies and the founder of that program also here at, at Utah Valley University and is currently working on a book on uh, Mormon theology and Christian, the Christian tradition uh, to be published or it's forthcoming in uh, with uh, Oxford University Press. Michael Minch um, is also an associate professor of philosophy here at Utah Valley University and received um, his PhD in political science at the University of Utah, as well as an MDiv at Drew University before that, is that correct? Um, and is an expert in both the fields of uh, political theology, theology generally, as, as well as political theory. Um, and uh, is the founder of the Peace and Justice Studies program here and the current director of that program uh, as well. Uh, so why don't you join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Well, it fell to me to start first, and so I am. <laughs> I, would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that it's not, it's not entirely accurate, it's not at all accurate that I'm the founder of the Peace and Justice Studies program, but I was one of the persons who helped get that off the ground with, with many other people, so I uh, want to mention that. Uh, I feel a little bit at risk today because uh, my position will be unpopular for most people in the room, I believe. So all I can do is ask that you listen as carefully as you can and uh, don't believe I'm saying anything that I am not saying. And uh, we'll have a lot of time for questions afterwards and that'll be a good time for clarification. The title of my, both Brian and I are going to give brief papers so we have plenty of time to answer questions uh, later. And the title of my uh, paper is Thoughts About Words and Definitions with Special Reference to words, the Words Christian and Christianity. <clears throat> I want to offer a short reflection of the meaning and, and coherence of words. Words are, as we all know, dynamic. They are in flux and always in some state of change. But we also know that they are not infinitely elastic and that if they change too fast, we can't hold on to their meanings and we lose the ability to communicate with words under such duress. Further, even when words are used ubiquitously, it does not follow that they hold common, agreed upon meanings for us. Many words are used pervasively and the meanings of those words are still unknown contested and confused. Let me give you some easy examples. It is a commonplace among political theorists that the words conservative, Republican, liberal, and democracy are ubiquitously misunderstood and consequently misused in ordinary popular discourse in the United States. It's not just that non-specialists use these words differently than do political theorists. For if lay people used these words in ways whereby they all knew what those words meant and they all agreed upon the meanings, that would be fine. Rather, the vast majority seems not to know what these words mean and people seem to mean, mean many different things when using these words. We commonly and comfortably use words in cases where we do not know their meanings and others hold them to mean things other than we do, other than what we mean by them. So, I trust that what I've just said is uncontested. But the plainness of this claim should not distract us from its importance. 
Words often denote power, and power often corrupts. We must not only be careful to stand guard against the bewitching of our words and language, we must also be careful with our words because, among other things, they exclude some others sometimes. The question is, can we, when we think exclusion is a necessary feature of our words, exclude with gentleness, with love, and with humility, and a desire to overcome the exclusion? How can we turn exclusionary words into words of welcome and inclusion while remaining faithful to the meanings of those words? I have directed a couple of Habitat for Humanity affiliates and occasionally heard from non-Christians who worked with us or wanted to do so that they wished we would drop the word Christian from our identity and documents. They wanted to build houses with the poor they just didn't want to be associated with the Christian organization while they were doing it. What were we to make of that request? Of course Habitat is a Christian organization, just insofar as its creation, design, development, intention, and purpose has always been, from its inception, explicitly about a way of being Christian. The conception behind Habitat is that because God in Christ loves the world and guides and empowers his followers to do the same, one thing they do is build homes for and with those who have insufficient shelter. Would someone argue that the right thing to do in response to the request to drop the modifier Christian is to do so? How would such an argument be made? Yet. I realize that the word Christian has always been inviting and excluding, ordinary and strange, banal and scandalous. It cannot be anything other than this. The word should be used carefully, for among other reasons, it is so easily used as a weapon. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury and an excellent theologian to boot, writes that a good deal of what earlier Christian generations took easily, or apparently easily, for granted, now creates puzzles and uncertainties, or even just boredom. Here the Christian community faces a very complicated set of issues. If we proceed to revise and adjust so as to avoid any hint of difficulty, we are likely to find that we have ironed out much of what challenges us by its very strangeness. We leave no room for depth. To be created. Whereas sensitivity to others' thoughts and beliefs can paralyze a community, it is also true, he writes, that to refuse to be sensitive, to defend an uncritically pious use of a tradition, equally prevents the language from working, since it makes it the conscience preserve of one group defending its position against another. What we most need is to know what Christian theology exists, that to know that Christian theology exists, not to assert positions, but to push us in a relationship to the truth whereby we can be changed by that truth. The goal is that we should be set free from an attitude of ownership where the words and images of faith are concerned. Williams writes that the church is always renewed from the edges rather than the center. There must be a certain poriosity between church and not church, the world. He claims that the church must tirelessly seek new horizons in its own experience and in its encounters with others. He notes that our religiousness is often used as a weapon against God. Indeed, Williams calls Christians to the experience of being footwashed by non-Christians, becoming aware that their touch is the pressure of God. Those who know anything of the meaning of Jesus washing his disciples' feet knows of Williams's call for Christians to receive intimate care imposed upon us, just as it makes us squirm with discomfort and humility. Likewise, the Mennonite theologian John Howard Yoder writes that non-Christians play an important role for the Christian community, especially when it is disobedient. The Bible is, after all, a public document. He notes Gandhi and Marx as two examples of 
as a kind of people who help Christians know what it means to be Christian. In his essay, Meaning After Babel, he writes that pluralism is a providential occasion for clarification. It may enable us to see something about the gospel that was not visible before. In body politics, he writes that the adversary is part of my true finding process. I need to hear the adversary. He notes that the genuineness of dialogue demands in both directions that there be no disavowal in principle of my witnessing becoming an open option for the other. More importantly, I would add, we should also see the other's witness as an open option for ourselves. Yoder agrees, although he doesn't put it just this way, and this is part of what he means when he understands dialogue and mission as epistemological nonviolence. We find the meanings of words at their borders, just as Christianity finds its meaning at the borders. Democratic theorist Roman Coles refers to the border at the core of radical democracy and Christianity. There is something quite right about this. And so in recognizing that our words and concepts must often be exclusionary by definition, we must with humility and courage worry about and, and work on the challenge of that borderland. It is in this connection that I am concerned about my remarks today. I worry that they will be heard so as to signify my desire to exclude. But this is not what motivates me to engage in this discussion. I fear that some may think that I am motivated to exclude Latter-day Saints from the territory called Christian. That I am seeking to draw the definition of Christian tighter and smaller than is warranted. In response, one of the things I can say is that I may be drawing it smaller than such critics would assume. For I am not sure, for example, that most Southern Baptists are Christians. My claims here are, however, fundamentally about the way words work, as I understand it. Only derivatively are my remarks about the meaning of the words Christian and Christianity. My interlocutor today, Dr. Birch, who is, I should, everyone should know, a dear friend, is interested in this question in regard primarily, I think, to the differences in the meaning of these words as understood by Christian and Latter-day Saint traditions, respectively. Because words and concepts find their meanings at the border and in contestation with and challenging conceptions, and the border between these two communities is a good place to interrogate the meaning of Christian and Christianity. Because these words are theological and both communities agree that their meanings are theological by definition, one strategy is to compare theological claims that either or both communities take to be definitive. I cannot speak to what is definitive within the LDS community, but of course there have to be some conceptions <coughs> that are. This is to say that the meaning of the words Christian and Christianity and the word Mormon and Mormonism are criteriological and the criteria are theological. Historically and in respect to orthodoxy, Christians of all stripes believe three things. Now, in respect to orthodoxy, I know that it is a complicated matter as to what respects history has shaped orthodoxy and orthodoxy has shaped Christian. Uh, shape Christian history. And we don't have time today to investigate this problematic, but many, including various Mormon thinkers, argue that the historical nature of the development of orthodoxy is precisely what calls claims to orthodoxy into question. But of course, if historical contingency means that words can mean whatever we say they mean without boundary, in utter promiscuous manner, then it means that we live in a definitionless world as this is the only meaning of complete arbitrariness in assigning meanings. And we know, of course, that words do have meanings. Otherwise, using them for communicative purposes would be useless. Indeed, they would not exist. Furthermore, when I refer to Christians of all stripes, I mean 
<coughs> Christians of the Catholic, Anabaptist, Orthodox, and Protestant traditions. Now here, obviously, I am making a normative and formal claim what Christians normatively and, and formally believe. First, there has always been and always will be Christians of all stripes have believed one God and one God only in the universe. Radical monotheism that denies any other God in any sense, in any way, is a sine qua non of Christianity. Second, that Jesus of Nazareth was God, fully, completely God. The term son used in respect to Jesus the Christ is metaphorical. Third, all human beings are brought into proper relationship with God by God's grace. Such relationship is gift. We do not and cannot earn, merit, or achieve such a relationship to God. In contrast, Latter-day Saints typically and formally believe, first, in the potential existence, if not the present reality, of more than one God. Mormon teaching is polytheistic. Second, Mormons believe that Jesus is the literal Son of God, he is not fully, completely God, but the offspring of God. God generated Jesus. And third, Latter-day Saints believe that salvation is, in part, acquired, achieved, merited. Now, it is my understanding that these three beliefs, especially the last, are tugged at from various sources within Mormon thought. Perhaps these doctrinal teachings are not as rigid as I seem to make them out to be, they may be somewhat in flux. Historically, we may be in a moment when LDS theology is moving ever closer to Christian theology, Christian orthodoxy, in respect to these matters. Yet, I suspect that for some, the theological differences and similarities are beside the point. It is a popular view that if someone wants to call herself a Christian, the only decent thing to do is to nod one's head. But notice that if words have meanings, and we all know they do, then no word is infinitely elastic, and words must be criteriological. Notice that Mormons believe this as much as anybody. Note the oddity, if not the contradiction, for example, of Mormons complaining about not being considered Christian at the same time they deny that fundamentalist Mormons are Mormon. We all know that words are criteriological by definition. If I were to claim to be a Muslim, or a Republican with a capital R, or a woman, or a Mormon, my claim would be rejected easily and swiftly by those respective groups. We simply aren't what we say we are just because we say it. Such a thought is seen to be incoherent after a moment's reflection. The question then is, what criteria count to constitute a concept and the meanings of the words that signify the concept? The answer is, of course, historical. Those who bring words into existence and use them for themselves and among themselves for generations and perhaps centuries and sometimes even millennia ought to get to define their own words. Notice that the single most pressing question for the earliest Christian communities was whether it was the case that Christians were Jews and whether in order to be a Christian one must be a Jew as well. This is a question of identity and why and how peoples get to identify themselves. Christians came quite quickly to understand themselves as something different than Jews in that while one could remain a Jew and be a Christian, one need not be a Jew. Christians made the decision not to try to take the identity of Jews away from Jews. They decided not to engage in identity theft. Of course, there remains an interesting boundary between Judaism and Christianity. Stanley Harawas, speaking about Christian orthodoxy, notes that it is the hard-won wisdom of the church. Too often it is forgotten that, for example, the canon of scripture is orthodoxy. 
If the church had not decided against Marcion, that is, if the church had followed Marcion in eliminating the Old Testament and the Gospels because they were too Jewish, then we would have appeared more coherent, but we would have lost the tension that is at the core of the Christian faith. Christians worship the Lord of Israel. It is too often forgotten that Trinity names a reading rule that demands Christians read the Old Testament as our scripture. That means we can never avoid the challenge of Jewish readings to our readings. So orthodoxy is not the avoidance of an argument. Orthodoxy is the naming of arguments across time that must take place if we are to be faithful to Jesus. Later, he adds that mission is constitutive of Christianity because when you have to go beyond where you were, then you will discover things that you hadn't known were part of your story. The gospel requires vulnerability if it is to be true to itself. Of course, what Harawas says about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity also holds true for the relationship of Mormonism and Christianity. Rediscovering our identity through vulnerability to others is crucial as a defining characteristic of those two of those people shaped by Jesus. Now, if my account is roughly correct, then this matter is not only historical but also moral in character. That is, if a latter community begins to use the identifier of an earlier community as a means to identify itself, perhaps especially if they do so many centuries after the earlier community has been using the identifier, is this not a form of identity theft? Isn't there something rather discourteous, insensitive, and perhaps triumphalistic or even hostile in doing this? Or to switch the metaphor, if one is living in a home her forebears built, a home very long in the family, and a stranger walks into the home uninvited and announces that he now lives there too, is this not an intrusion? Intrusion. Perhaps the homeowner should, given enough time and information and trust, find a way to allow the stranger to move in but shouldn't this be a negotiated agreement? Vulnerability may lead to a relationship and an invitation, but vulnerability for the sake of vulnerability is incoherent. Now, Brian and I agree that words are criterial or criteriological in nature, but I think that Brian thinks they are more than that. We'll probably see in a moment. I am not sure what more there is to it, such that more doesn't end up being a criterial facet, something that makes a criterion a criterion, or a criterion of the criteria. Of course, criteria are historical, sociological, cultural, political, and so on. That is, they are contingent in respect to their development. We, we all know that. But this truth does not diminish, let alone contradict, the truth of the account I've just given. If Latter-day Saints continue to use the word Christian to identify themselves, which of course is something relatively new to LDS history, it seems that they could do the following. First, demonstrate a recognition in regard for the account that I have sketched here. That is, deal with the complicated nature of using that word. Second, and concomitantly, stop using the language of offense when Christians disagree about the status of Mormons as Christians. A Latter-day Saint may consider himself a Christian, but should know enough to know why a Catholic, a Baptist, a Lutheran, or a Methodist would disagree. Why would people who disallow the use of the word Mormon to those who hold to original Mormon beliefs be offended by those who hold to Christian beliefs when the word Christian is wanted as when those want to hold the word Christian to have the same meaning it has had for centuries. Christians should want to engage in dialogue and theological, theological explanation and exploration with others. As the first part of my paper meant to show, 
This is an important enterprise for epistemological and Christian reasons. Again, we find out what our words mean and who we are at the border, which is also the core. This is the place of humility and courage. All communities at the border must realize, moreover, that humility and courage means a willingness to give up precious claims when reasons demand we do so. Latter-day Saints have been calling for Christians to give up their hegemony over the words Christian. Very well. Perhaps that will one day happen overall, even though many Christians have already given this up. But I have yet to hear one Mormon person give up his or her claim to the word Christian. The border is, after all, the border for both communities. Many Christians argued that in order for Christians to be Christians, they must be Jews and appropriate that word as well. These Christians lost the argument to other Christians. And I would like to challenge my Latter-day Saint friends to engage in such an argument of their own. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today and I'd especially like to thank uh, Don Lavange uh, who uh, helped make this possible. Don has been the kind of go-between between between Michael and me for the past at least few months. Uh, Michael would walk into uh, Don's office and Don would engage him in some uh, conversation or other about this question and Michael would be able to uh, express himself as only he can. And then uh, a day later I would walk in the office and Don would would ask me uh, to respond to what Michael said the day before, and then I would be allowed the opportunity to express myself uh, uh, as only I can. <laughs> so this is a great opportunity for us to come together and actually dialogue. Even though we talk often, we commute back and forth from campus together and talk about a lot of things, uh, but uh, this is the first public opportunity for us to engage each other in this question. So I'll read for about maybe 20 minutes or so and then ask a couple of questions and then Michael and I will uh, engage uh, in discussion with you about some of these issues. What does it mean to identify oneself or others as a Christian? The question is not as straightforward as it may seem at first blush. It can be approached from a number of directions and can, and can have important implications for theology, comparative religion, sociology, journalism, and politics, to name a few. By examining more deeply the meaning of Christian identity, I believe we can move a long way toward clarifying confusion and avoiding misunderstanding that persists in our public discourse. To put the question in terms of philosophical jargon, we can ask, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for being a Christian? Can these conditions be discreetly identified? What criteria do we use in our analysis of this term? My approach to these questions has been largely informed by the philosophical writings of Ludwig Wittgenstein, whose later work was an attempt to show us that the meaning of words is logically connected to their use within a particular social context. The obvious implication being that the same word can have different meanings depending on its application within a shared set of linguistic practices. Another important component of Wittgenstein's work was to rule out the possibility of private meaning. Language is essentially a social phenomenon, as Michael has, uh, has pointed out. Concepts are not private. Subjective, uh, excuse me, concepts are not private subjective images in the mind. Rather, they are publicly mediated phenomena that are held in place by the social practices that are constitutive of a shared language and culture. Thus, for Wittgenstein, as for me, it is senseless to speak of a private concept. As it relates to the question at hand, it may be then argued 
that one cannot call oneself a Christian and do so relying upon a personal and private meaning. A few days ago when I was discussing the politics of Christian exclusion with another friend here on campus, he responded by saying, why would you want to exclude anyone? My reply was to point out that one cannot legitimately refer to herself as a Christian simply because she chooses the term for herself. And while I embrace the ethical sensibility behind my friend's remark, a concept cannot be meaningfully, meaningfully applied unless there are boundary conditions for its use in relation to other concepts. Semantic solipsism is not an option. So on this, Michael and I agree. So given these considerations, an effective way into our question is to reflect upon the multifarious uses of the term Christian in the effort to show how these might be confused in public discussion that surrounds them. The first sense of the word Christian is what I call the theologically normative sense of the term. There are some today who argue that Catholics are not appropriately to be considered Christian. For these same people, or many of these same people, there is no such thing as a heretical Christian as that term is defined within their particular religious tradition. So that's the first sense of the term Christian, theologically normative. The second sense is what I'm calling the ecumenical sense of the term. And this ecumenical sense has some relation to the theologically normative sense, though it is more inclusive and depends more upon the historical development of Christianity uh, to define it. And it's this ecumenical sense of the word Christian that uh, is broadly understood by Christians in the traditions Michael specified as being appropriate to the term. And then third, there is what I'm calling the secular sense of the term Christian. And this, has, and this use of the term has a broader connotation and is used uh, in secular institutions of our society, uh, including uh, scholars of religions who do uh, comparative religious studies, uh, journalists and others in more ordinary public discourse. So I would like to argue that there are at least three, and these are three important ways in which the word Christian is used. Okay, And, and uh, you'll see why I make these distinctions in a moment. In the aftermath of 9-11, we observed, for example, a very public debate regarding Muslim identity. Scores of Muslim clerics in the United States were quick to point out that the 9-11 terrorists were not real Muslims. But of course the reference to the word real here relies on a theological or perhaps more appropriately a moral set of criteria in order to make that claim. Some of you remember the uh, well-known article by Andrew Sullivan in the New York Times Magazine shortly after 9-11 uh, entitled, This is a Religious War, in which he makes many of these same claims. And, what he, and one point that he makes, it's very important, is that, that it just won't do for the Muslim community to say that Osama bin Laden and the 9-11 terrorists were not Muslim simply because of a certain set of moral acts that they did and one thing he wanted to point out was that he wanted to call into question the way in which these people were marginalizing these radical Muslims from the community. And uh, now this is not to say that Sullivan was uh, justifying any, any uh, uh, horrible actions by this marginal group, but only to get clear on what we mean when we invoke these terms like Muslim, Christian, uh, Buddhist, etc. The purpose of this foray into semantics is to lay the groundwork for the central claim of this paper, namely that in the public discussion of Christian identity, different applications of the term are conflated in ways that lead to confusion and misunderstanding. A second and related point is this. While I certainly recognize and acknowledge the claim of someone who asserts that another group is not Christian, they must recognize the sense in which they are using the term and should not expect others in the wider society to accept their criteria for the purposes of public discussion. The best way, I believe, to illustrate these points is to apply them to a concrete example as a test of their value. 
and it will come as no surprise to many of you that the case I wish to examine is that of Mormonism. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has from its beginnings occupied a space in the borderlands of Christianity. The question concerning uh, or the question of situating Mormons on the Christian spectrum raises tough questions for the Christian community as well as for Mormons themselves, or so I would argue. In a 1985 address to educators within the LDS Church, Apostle Dallin Oaks said, quote, As a fervent and fast-growing group of believers who persistently disdain the comfortable fraternity of ecumenical Christianity, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a subject of abiding fascination for the news media. End quote. More recently, in a newsroom statement uh, uh, on LDS.org, uh, the church released uh, a statement entitled, Approaching Mormon Doctrine. And one of the points they raise here is this, quote, those writing or commenting on Latter-day Saint doctrine also need to understand that certain words in the Mormon vocabulary have slightly different meanings and connotations than those same words have in other religions. For example, Latter-day Saints generally view being born again as a process of conversion, whereas many other Christian denominations often view it as a conversion that happens in one defining moment. Sometimes what some may consider an argument or dispute over doctrine is really a misunderstanding of simple differences in terminology. So it's clear that there are distinctions that are important in trying to understand the relationship between Mormonism and mainstream Christ, uh, 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 Christian thought. So how are we to understand Mormonism? Is Mormonism a Christian denomination alongside Presbyterians, Catholics, and Baptists? Is it best defined as a heretical Christian sect? Mormonism is certainly heterodox if what we mean by heterodox is a set of beliefs outside traditional norms. Or, as has been proposed by some, is Mormonism a new religious tradition in its own right? It may be helpful to take a minute to reflect on this idea. In 1987, uh, uh, historian Jan Ships argued that Mormonism is to Christianity what Christianity was to Judaism. Uh, sociologist of religion uh, Rodney Stark stated in a 1994 article that Mormonism, quote, stands on the threshold of becoming the first major faith to appear on earth since the prophet Muhammad rode out of the desert, end of quote. More provocatively, perhaps, is the suggestion by Richard Land that Mormonism is best designated as, quote, a fourth Abrahamic religion. For those who are unaware, Richard Land is president of the Southern Baptist Convention's powerful Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission and an influential voice in the evangelical community. This suggestion was made during the 2008 presidential campaign just weeks before the South Carolina primary elections. Land was publicly favorable toward Mitt Romney, who we all know uh, was a, a Latter-day Saint candidate, and it appeared that he was looking for a way to make Romney acceptable to evangelicals without having to declare Romney's Christian bona fides. As we all witnessed, Romney lost the South Carolina Republican primary, and the post-election data suggests that Romney's Mormon identity was a significant contributing factor in his defeat. From a Latter-day Saint perspective, the question of whether or not Mormons are Christian is a non-starter, however. H uh, Mormon historian Phil Barlow averred that the question is akin to, quote, asking if African Americans are human, end quote. What could possibly create such a question if not for deep misunderstanding and anti-Mormon hostility? Others have put it in more apocalyptic terms. And this uh, next quote comes from Alonzo Gaskill, who is a professor of religious education at BYU. Quote, Just as the early Christians were hated and persecuted by those who also professed membership in the House of Israel, Latter-day Saints will surely see a manifest increase in persecution and hatred by those who likewise profess a belief in Christ. Such can be expected because of the ever-increasing ideological divide between the worldly and the saintly, end of quote. 
One of the more popular scriptures among the Latter-day Saint faithful is the affirmation of the prophet Nephi in the Book of Mormon, wherein he says, quote, We talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy in, uh, of Christ, end quote. Joseph Smith sharpens the point in his declaration that, quote, The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it, end quote. Familiar quote to many of you, I'm sure. But it has, uh, but it has been these appendages that have kept other denominations from recognizing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a legitimate Christian religion. The moniker has been a theological term of art that doesn't lend itself to univocal meaning. The standard Latter-day Saint response to the question of Christian legitimacy can be distilled in terms of two basic principles. First, we should be considered Christian because we consider ourselves to be so, and second, we should be considered Christian because we affirm the essentials of the Christian faith. And that includes the divinity of Jesus Christ, the authority of the Bible, the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptism, resurrection, and the final judgment. This self-conscious Christian identity has been an evolving affair, which began with the countercult movement of the 1970s and the subsequent emergence of Mormonism on the world stage. The issue, however, has not been confined to the zealous activity of conservative evangelical Christians. Between 1995 and 2001, five major Christian denominations formally demurred in their consideration of Mormonism as part of the Christian community of faith. These include the Roman Catholic Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Southern Baptist Convention, and the Missouri Synod of the Lutheran Church. In 2001, for example, the Vatican ruled that baptisms performed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will no longer be recognized as Catholic rites. The Congregation on the Doctrine of, of the Faith, the gatekeepers of Catholic Orthodoxy, determined that the LDS doctrines of baptism and the Trinity are outside acceptable theological limits to be considered Christian. A ruling like this is a rare occurrence for the congregation, which has offered a scant six decisions on baptismal questions since 1970. And there has been only one ruling since the 2001 decision. Since the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church has recognized baptisms of other Christian groups as efficacious rites of the Church. Persons converting to Catholicism no longer need to be rebaptized in order to be in full communion with the Church. Despite this ecumenical gesture, it was argued that Latter-day Saint baptisms did not meet the appropriate theological criteria due to their specific doctrinal beliefs. A semi-official explanation was penned in the Vatican newspaper, The Roman Observer, and was written by Luis Lotteria, who at the time was the secretary of the International Theological Commission, an advising body to the Congregation on the Doctrine of the Faith. After a brief excursion into LDS cosmology, Lotteria concludes that, quote, the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have for the Mormons a meaning totally different from the Christian meaning. The differences are so great that one cannot even consider that this doctrine is a heresy, which emerged out of a false understanding of the Christian doctrine. The teaching of the Latter-day Saints has a completely different matrix." End quote. This categorization is important because the Catholic Church does not disqualify baptisms performed by those who advocate heresy. Thus, Mormons are left to aspire to heresy to gain Christian legitimacy. The Presbyterian decision in 1995 was itself informed by a position paper entitled Presbyterians and Mormons, a study in contrast. Though their findings offer the important qualifier that Mormonism is not within the, quote, historic apostolic tradition of the Christian church, end quote, the results are similar. Latter-day Saints are not to be considered part of the ecumenical Christian community. Being outside the historic apostolic tradition is, as we have seen, a characterization with which Mormons would be comfortable, or most Mormons. However, as a result of this ruling, 
the relationship between Presbyterians and Mormons was officially designated as interfaith rather than as ecumenical. And that's an important distinction within their tradition. Similarly to the Vatican, the Presbyterian Church USA places strong emphasis on the Latter-day Saint doctrine of God as being outside the acceptable bounds of Trinitarian theology, and hence reason to exclude them from the community of Christianity. To the chagrin of many Mormons, there has been growing consensus that the ecumenical Christian tent does not quite reach to the Latter-day Saints. For these major denominations, there is something more to Christian identity than the sharing of a core set of beliefs, or even in the, the public uh, recognition of the historical creeds. For, as many of us know, several Christian groups consider themselves to be anti-creedal. However, identifying exactly what this more consists of has not been a straightforward proposition. This returns us to the question of criteria. Much of the understanding appears to be confusion over how the term Christian is applied in various contexts of public discourse. What Latter-day Saints desire, or what they've desired in their most recent discourse, is what they call a broad descriptive application of the term so as to include them. This is especially true in media discourse where the public perception of Mormonism is at stake. In his analysis of the Presbyterian documents, BYU religion professor Kent Jackson argues that, quote, there is nothing in LDS doctrine that would exclude anyone of any denomination who believes in the Jesus Christ of the New Testament, end quote. For this reason, Mormons continue to be mystified by the protectionism on display in the Christian community. At least for the purposes of secular public discourse, Latter-day Saints see their exclusion as irrational and too narrowly theological. And I would agree. However, recent events surrounding polygamous groups in Utah raise the question of boundary maintenance for Mormons themselves. A diverse array of religious groups trace their history back to Joseph Smith. The largest group, uh, of course, is the Utah-based LDS Church uh, and the Community of Christ, previously known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The most visible of the remaining movements uh, beyond these two is the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In communities in Utah and now in Texas, the group continues to endorse the practice of polygamy in a socially cloistered environment. Recognized as the FLDS prophet, Warren Jeffs led the community until his 2007 conviction on charges related to child rape. In April 2008, Texas authorities took custody of 416 children in the FLDS compound in San Angelo, Texas. The case predictably captured the attention of the national and international media and lingered on for several months. In a swift response to the onslaught of media coverage, the LDS Church worked feverishly to distance itself from the Texas group and implored the media to report a clear distinction between the two. Survey data indicated that a large percentage of the public did not understand the differences between Latter-day Saints and their fundamentalist nemeses. In jeopardy was the hard-fought and carefully cultivated reputation of the LDS Church. As part of their effort, the church specifically requested that the media refrain from using the term fundamentalist Mormon in reference to these communities. In response, Principal Voices, an advocacy group for fundamentalist communities, issued a statement on July 9, 2008 that read, quote, We strenuously object to any efforts to deprive us and others of the freedom to name and describe ourselves by terms of our own choosing. Fundamentalist Mormons have been referred to by that name since the 1930s, often by the church itself. We are proud of our Mormon heritage, end quote. With a hint of satisfaction, the group raised the specter of a double standard. Quote, ironically, the LDS church has been justifiably uncomfortable with repeated assertions by members of some Christian denominations that Latter-day Saints are not Christians, end of quote. The irony is only present, however, if the Christian and Mormon cases are analogous. But are they? 
In what ways is the LDS complaint about Christian exclusion comparable to the fundamentalist complaint about Mormon exclusion? The day after the principal voices statement, the LDS Church released a document of its own justifying its efforts to protect the term Mormon. The thrust of their arguments was that the term has historically been associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. To associate this name with any other group creates undue confusion in the minds of the public. Calling to mind the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, Mormon missionaries, and the Mormon temples, the point was made that these have, quote, long been ingrained in the public consciousness, end quote. The appeal to common usage was an effective response. No one can reasonably argue against the idea that Mormon has overwhelmingly be, been associated with the Latter-day Saints. Resistant journalists, however, continue to maintain that the use, that excuse me, continue to maintain that use of the fundamentalist qualifier is appropriate in maintaining accuracy. The level of intrigue increases, however, as the statement proceeds. And this is from, again, the, uh, the, the LDS Church statement. Quote, when the term Mormon is stretched out of proportion to apply to any group, however large or small, aspiring to establish a church in the tradition of Joseph Smith, only confusion ensues. Reduced to its lowest common denominator, the word Mormon loses its long-established associations among the public, rendering it unrecognizable." End quote. Public debate over Mormonism, however, reveals that this line of reasoning has been used against Latter-day Saints in their effort to be identified as Christians. The looming danger is that the LDS statement could be used as a reductio ad absurdum argument against the church's claims to Christian identity. Furthermore, the statement uses as a counterexample from Christian history that hints at sensitivity to this issue. And again, this is another quote from the statement. All Christian denominations have some historical and theological connection to Catholicism. Nevertheless, this does not authorize them to use the word Catholic in their official name. Lutherans and Methodists do not call themselves Catholic fundamentalists, nor did the early Christians call themselves Reformed Jews. By declaring that any group professing Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon can rightly be called Mormon, as I stated before, is akin to declaring that any group that professes the, the Bible can rightly call itself Catholic. End quote. The use of the term Catholic in this case is peculiar. At first reading, the preferable term appears to be Christian, but this almost certainly would have drawn more attention to the self-defeating implications of the argument. The Catholic analogy raises yet another issue. As John Hamer, excuse me, John Hamer points out in his critique of the uh, LDS statement that quote, and this comes from his uh, uh, from By Common Consent, which is a, a, a Mormon blog. Quote, to make this analogy work properly, one must argue that the only people who can legitimately call themselves Christians are the Catholics, end quote. By parity of reasoning, the statement can be read to imply that the Catholic Church has a more legitimate claim to the term Christian than any other group. But given the absurdity of this proposition, Hamer attempts to show that there is something wrong with the analogy to begin with. Okay, so what can we conclude from the above considerations? The first thing I would like to, to ask or, or to assert is that we need to be careful about how we use religious language. We need to listen more carefully to how words are used and what follows from them. And third, that we need to be self-reflective in the defense of our own religious beliefs and give space for others to clarify their position in relation to us. And I want you to notice that both in Michael's and my remarks, there's a common thread of reasoning that runs behind Michael's argument in terms of Christian identity, the LDS Church's argument in terms of its identity, and the fundamentalist Mormon communities in terms of their identity. They all agree that we ought to be able to define ourselves, while each of the groups, right, to some degree, wants to criticize the self-identity of the other groups. And this seems to be at the heart of the problem. So I'll stop there and await your questions. Thank you. We're going to uh, take some questions now. I'm going to...
I'll, I'll call on you so that, that way they don't have to worry about figuring out who raised their hand first. And, um, and then they'll answer. But first, I want to ask Brian and Michael if, if they want to say anything in response to each other's papers before we have questions from the audience. Well, one thing, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they do, so we'll do that. Uh, maybe I misheard you, but I think you said that um, the view that I hold, the mainstream Christian view, is both too narrowly, too narrowly construed for theological reasons or too theologically narrowly construed. I can understand that critique. I think you also said it's irrational. Well, am I mishearing you? I don't recall making that claim okay. specifically. Good. <laughs> that, but, but, we're, but we've got we've got that, videotape. That would to, make uh, that would make for such an uncomfortable to. ride home. If that were, you know. <laughs> but I'm driving today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that would make for a very uncomfortable walk home on my yeah. part. <laughs> I, I think the quote was the members see it as irrational. The members see it. As irrational. But but I think he said then, and I agree. Well, yeah. Let me let me yeah. Let me be. Let me say a couple things, and then I'll go back to the point at which I said I agree, and the and the point I was agreeing because I wouldn't, I wouldn't affirm. Uh, uh, that. I want to uh, raise a couple of questions about this same issue of construing the term Christian in a what I call a a, a normative theological sense, because uh, Michael said at one point, and I'm paraphrasing, of course that for a, for a tradition or a group of people that has, has been part of a faith for centuries and perhaps millennia, uh, it ought to be the case that they get to define their own terms. Okay? My question would be, who is the they? Okay? Because that, that's an important question within, within uh, uh, Christian history uh, and theology. Uh, uh, who is, the, who is appropriately part of the Christian community of faith? I think what sits behind Michael's uh, claims, and he explicitly acknowledges this, that it's a moral theological sense, is that Orthodox Christianity is Christianity. Okay? But there are, there are groups who claim that non-Orthodox Christianity can be referred to as Christianity in a legitimate sense of the term, and what I mean by legitimate there is in the ordinary discourse in society. For example, if a, if a Sunni Muslim said that Shiite Muslims were not Muslims, we would be puzzled. We would want to say something like, well, that's a kind of insider theological set of considerations, right? But in terms of the Shiite affirmation, uh, of the five pillars of Islam, the recognition of the Quran, etc., right? On the core points of doctrine, uh, they would be considered Muslims, and they consider themselves Muslims. So the accusation that another group is not appropriately part of the faith is oftentimes itself a confession of faith. And what I would like to argue is that that, that confessional sense of the term leaks over into public secular discourse so that when journalists and scholars are trying to report on various groups that confusion ensues in the minds of the public because, uh, because there are these boundary uh, uh, groups like Mormonism which someone would want, would want to say, well the Mormons call themselves Christian and they affirm the essentials of Christianity, of course that's a contentious term, what counts as essential, but in terms of a broader secular conception, you would want to say, of course Mormons are Christian. So that, that kind of overlap, overlap and confusion, I think, is what characterizes much of the, the debate over, uh, over Mormonism. And uh, a second question would be uh, this. Uh, we know that, that many movements that consider themselves Christian, 
have, have come and gone in the history of the Christian tradition. And that certain groups were marginalized and considered heretical by uh, established authorities of the church. So the question is then raised, were these people who were declared heretics, are they Christian? And were they only made not Christian after the, the Orthodox community, however that is defined, determined them to be so? And if that's the case, then I think my position holds that the way in which uh, some people use the word Christian is too narrowly theological for broader discussion. Well, there, there are similarities insofar as Muslims debate what Islam means and Christians and Mormons debate what Christianity means, there, there are similarities. But the, the difference for me is that I have no, I cannot enter into that dialogue and I, can, I have no judgments to render ab about the Islam conversation. Uh, Whereas, in respect to uh, the meaning of the word Christian and, and, and the meaning of the word Christianity, I, I believe I'm uh, sufficiently informed a as to render an opinion. And um, so I can participate in that, that conversation with, with Latter-day Saints. Uh, however, you know, impoverished my contribution is. But, but, but the distinction there, I think, is, is, is really important in that um, I, I, uh, I, I think that it's easy to make judgments about religiousness, religious communities and, and religious words very easily. And we, it, it, it should be very hard to make such judgments. You know, I, I, don't want, I don't want to, for example, engage in the kind of conversation Brian and I are having today by talking about Mormonism. I, I just, I don't have any business doing that. Uh, so so uh, my, my side of the debate just has to be about what I think Christianity means from, from the, the perspective that is normatively described as Orthodox or traditional or mainstream Christianity. Just, just a point. Can we repeat, try to repeat some portion oh. of the questions? So we'll cut out the dead air. Okay. But they're not on mic. So. Yeah, okay. Good, thanks. And I'll stop there. So, in addition to that, let's, let's make sure that the questions are questions, not comments. They're comments, I'm going to cut you off and stop you. <laughs> and, um, and, and that you have a question quickly and make your point quickly. Okay, so I, I, Hang on, I, I, I'd like to respond. Um, uh, the question was uh, that, that Michael answered was to respond to the, 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 the comparison or analogy I was trying to draw between the internal issues regarding Muslim identity and the Christian Mormon identity issue uh, that, that, uh, that is the basis of our, of our conversation. Let me say a couple of things. If we were, if, if the news media were to report on uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And uh, the, the Muslim community was paying attention to the attacks. And the news media re reported that, uh, that these attacks were not committed by Muslims. That would be puzzling, right? Because at a, at, at a certain level of discourse, given what we know about extremist groups of this sort, they use uh, Muslim language, imagery, and theology. Now, they may use it wrongly, right, and for horrible purposes, but the, the point is they use that kind of imagery uh, and they consider themselves to be the true bearers of the faith. That's what's interesting about fundamentalist groups, right? Fundam they're going back to the fundamentals of the faith. So, so in that case, I would argue that these qualifiers are appropriate, right? Uh, 
uh, these radical Muslim groups, because within a certain understanding of radical, that's certainly appropriate, right? Or fringe groups, those are certainly appropriate. But to rely on an internal normative theological concept uh, in, order to get, in order to classify these groups in relation to each other, I think raises some very serious problems. And that's what I think has happened with Mormonism. And that's what I think the LDS Church struggles with in trying to protect the word Mormon. Because if you talk to um, members of the FLDS community, you would find that there are many beliefs that they share in common. Right? And there are many beliefs that are not held in common. And, but the issue has to do with trying to identify these groups historically and from a sociological perspective more often than trying to identify which one is the appropriate bearer of the tradition. And I would say that's an internal question, uh, not one that is appropriate to apply in secular public discourse. Uh, so that's why I raise the, the Muslim example, is to give yet another analogy uh, to show the challenge of trying to describe other groups and yet do justice to them on their own terms. I would say that the, that the, the issues are more complex if one looks at it historically and, and sociolinguistically, then, uh, then, then at first, uh, as I said in the beginning of my paper, then at first uh, blush. And so uh, uh, while it has historically been the case that Mormons have wanted to uh, separate themselves from the mainstream Christian community, almost anyone who's an observer of Mormonism sees that there's more of an effort to identify themselves as Christian and to resonate with more of the traditional theological concepts. Of course, and that's an, that's an issue that's in, in, internal to Mormonism, but I think that, uh, that, uh, that, as I said in the latter part of my paper, we, we need to be careful in categories. We need to dig more deeply and not overgeneralize with regard uh, to these groups, uh, and the more careful we are, the more we can see both commonalities between Mormonism and mainstream Christian theology, and, and also the differences. The question is, what ones we, we highlight uh, and display and put up for public use, and, and those that we downplay and ignore and marginalize in the tradition. And uh, uh, it's certainly the case that, that Mormonism has wrestled with the way in which it uses these traditional Christian terms like monotheism, trinity, and other concepts uh, to identify itself. Do you want to comment? No, that's good. Well, I may, I, I may misunderstand your question, but I don't believe that the definition of Christianity existed before. No, I'm saying the word Christian existed before your definition of Christian. Well, so how can we define? I, I, not, my, my remarks can't, shouldn't be, heard to mean that I don't think there isn't development within the Christian tradition because it, it would be not it would be insane to make that claim. I mean obviously there's been development within the Christian tradition. So when you so with that development, would you say that Mormonism has the same bounds of development of any Christian? Well I I don't think so for all the reasons I arg I argued See, what we're doing now, and I'm going to stop it, is just what, talking in a circle to each other. I mean, I know what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying. So how can we use your definition of Christian? Look at, 
all words, all concepts, all traditions, all narratives, all communities, all human phenomena, and all religions are dynamic. They are all in a state of change. Of course. That doesn't mean there aren't boundaries. That doesn't mean there aren't con contestations. That doesn't mean there aren't parameters and, and shape. And, you know, I, I meant to address this, your question, when I noted that, for example, the early church wrestled with the question of whether to be a Christian, it meant you must also be a Jew. And through a period of time, historically speaking, a relatively short period of time, they came to the question that the answer to that question is no. Now, as Brian inferred, he didn't name any of the groups, but Brian mentioned that there have been other such contestations, the Waldensians, the Arians, the, the Albigensians, you know, the Donatists, you know, I'll stop. But of course, there has always been any number of groups at the boundary, and there have been decisions made about whether they belong in or out, and what it means to be in and what it means to be out. And so we're in a very interesting moment in history right now because there's a fuzzy, porous, interpenetrating boundary between Christianity as it's normatively described by most of its adherents and, and Mormons. And so I realize we're in a time of flux, we're in a time of change, we're in a time of investigation, we're in a time of interrogation, and that's all great in my view. That, that's wonderful. But it doesn't mean, as Brian also said, that people sort of, you know, snap their fingers and they are whatever they say they are. It's, it's far more complicated than that. I mentioned, for example, three criteria that Christians have come to believe with a kind of profound consensus that are definitions of Christian faith. Well, obviously the monotheism wasn't an issue, right? Yeah. But the matter of grace and the matter of the status of Jesus, that was an issue. Those were two important issues, weren't they? Let me, let me make a comment, uh, because it takes me back to the, 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 uh, the alleged charge of irrationality. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let me state what I said, because I agree with what I said. I was horrified, though, by, by how it was taken. I said, for this reason, Mormons continue to be mystified by the protectionism on display in the Christian community, at least for the purposes of secular public discourse. Latter-day Saints see their exclusion as the irrational and too narrowly theological. And then I affirmed that. But the, the qualifier is vital to my argument, right, for the purposes of secular public discourse because I want to allow for somebody like Michael to make the claim that Mormons aren't Christian. I want to recognize that claim. I want to see how it relates to my understanding and my tradition's understanding, right? And I want to allow him that confession, but I want it to be recognized for what it is, namely a confession. But I don't want a journalist, right, or scholars of religion to have to stay within that when they report on Mormonism and Christianity and, and other issues because that creates tremendous confusion for Mormons. Another thing of interest is that uh, 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 many religious groups are nicknamed by other groups and then they adopt the nickname. And that's true in the case of Mormons and that's true in the case of Christians, right? Very likely from what we know historically, right? And the, the use of the word Mormon has been in flux within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? Because uh, uh, several years ago, the church went through a phase in its effort uh, in, in terms of public relations to downplay the term Mormon in relation to itself and encourage the media and members, as they still do to a large degree, to use words like Latter-day Saints and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And now, but now we have this new phenomenon 
where the church wants to uh, set boundaries around Mormon because of this very troubling situation with regard to the fundamentalist group. Right? So th I want to make one more point and then uh, move on. I would claim that the diversity in Christianity is deep, has been deep, and continues to be deep. And that the diversity that we see in Christianity on fundamental issues in theology needs to be recognized by, by people who engage in this debate. And I would argue that the diversity within the mainstream Christian community, that the diversity there is every bit as rich as there is across this boundary between Mormonism, Mormonism and mainstream Christian theology. And so the, the idea that Christians are unified with one conception on even the essentials of the faith from a sociological and from a historical standpoint can be misleading. The unity that is present in Christianity is a theological confession given cer a certain understanding of the idea that the Holy Spirit would always be with the church. And if you have the idea that the Holy Spirit will always be with the church, then whatever happens in Christian history is the right thing, by definition. So heretical groups that are excluded, right, can be considered non-Christian because of a certain way of understanding the term Christian and how the church and the Holy Spirit has operated in Christian history, right? There are certain groups, like Mormons, that don't accept that theological confession of faith about Christian history. So that's another point of consideration, I think. Uh, before I answer that, I, I'll only speak for myself, but Dennis and Brian, I know, I know we, should, we should let everybody go at 4.30 if they want to go, but also I'm willing to stay and we, and we can continue to field questions for those of you who want to stay, at least. Yeah, if, sure. I don't mean to impose that on you, but... Okay, so to uh, briefly answer your question. Uh, Christians have never defined the meaning of Christianity as a moral... Uh, perspective in relationship to Jesus Christ. And it seems to me that what you're saying is that if someone thinks that Jesus is, uh, you know, sufficiently exemplary of, of human life, then, then that's what makes that person a Christian. But that's a... That's a idiosyncratic understanding of, of the of the word let me see if I can get clarity on, I'm not on, I, I must defend myself I'm not saying your question isn't valid I'm just answering your question I mean you're I appreciate your question but Methodists and Catholics and Mennonites and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Baptists and don't differentiate themselves from one another for, for ethical reasons. It's not about ethics. Yet you, uh, you believe that your first question has something to do with your second question, so I'm responding to you on the terms of your question as I understand it. The reason why there is a great multiplicity and diversity within the Christian church... Okay, let's... Yeah, this is, this is getting uh, unproductive. Let me add something. Uh, if somebody says, there, there can be a moral sense of the use of the word Christian. I can imagine a case, and I've heard many people say something like, you know, I, I'm trying to be a Christian. Where what they mean by that is that they're trying to live their lives according to certain ethical principles. That certainly makes sense. But that is... Uh, uh, in, in most respects beside the point of the issue at hand for us because both Mormons and Mennonites and Lutherans and Baptists and Catholics want to say that they are sincerely striving to follow what they understand the teachings of Jesus Christ to be. Right? So that's an issue upon which uh, I think Mormons and the mainstream Christian tradition can agree on that kind of 
moral conception of trying to be disciples of Christ. Right? The question becomes, what does that mean? What are the boundaries uh, of that? Uh, how is it understood in terms of other doctrines of the, of the, uh, of the tradition, like the Trinity, grace, scripture, revelation, etc.? So, uh, 